Besides the late schedule, I also have great sympathy for the audience. So I am not going to take more than 15 minutes and after that it's up to you to have questions or not to have questions. Thank you very much sir and I am really very happy to be here and talking to you. The topic today, no full stops in being Indian, obviously is taken from the well-known book by Mark Tully, no full stops in India. And this is something which was told by the late painter Jagdish Swaminathan to Mark in late 80s or early 90s. And Jagdish Swaminathan told Mark Tully, there are no full stops in India, only commas. So Mark Tully took the title of his fascinating book from this statement of Jagdish Swaminathan. And I agree with this. There are no full stops. There are only commas. But it seems, and I am not going into whether it's good or bad, but these days, there seem to be a lot of question marks on being an Indian. In fact, the invitation letter which at least I received was full of question marks. And uh, this is not a matter of concern, but this is a matter of great deliberation. This is a matter of great reflection. And this is a matter of some self-introspection. We were talking of corruption, parallel economies, and all that. I don't know how many of us do very seriously feel about another parallel, not just economy, but the political economy. And I'm referring here to the political economy of hurt sentiments. In this country today as an Indian, I am not too sure which statement of mine or which act of mine is going to hurt this community or that community, this segment or that segment, this identity or that identity. And even more interestingly, or maybe depressingly, as a citizen, as an individual, I cannot have faith in the protection provided by the law or provided by a democratic state against an attack on my person for having hurt the sentiment of someone. This is what I call the political economy of hurt sentiments. And this political economy of hurt sentiments is giving a lot of people an opportunity of making a lot of material and symbolic capital. I do not have a pessimistic view of things. Still, the fact remains that we cannot close our eyes to the problems the idea of India is facing today. We all know the liberal democratic values. We all talk of liberal and democratic values. We all talk of democracy, and we take great pride in being not only the largest, but if not the greatest, then one of the great democracies of the world. Let us pause and ponder over a question for a moment. Is democracy just about numbers? If that was the case, the much maligned Khap Panchayats are the perfectly democratic institutions. All the male members of the community are not represented, are physically present there. And still the Khap Panchayat is not a democratic institution because it does not hold the democratic values. The democratic values are basically rooted in the respect of the individual. Individual with community, not against the community necessarily, and sometimes even against the community. Democratic values are rooted in respect for the contesting viewpoint. Democratic values reflect and must reflect a respect for the private life of an individual. And that is why when India was imagined as a democratic setup, it was not just about numbers, it was also about judiciary, it was also about constitutional institutions like election commission and so on and so forth. I mean, for example, you just cannot 
say that this particular decision of election commission is not okay because the majority of people are not agreeing with it. It's not a question of majority and minority in certain matters. It's a question of certain constitutional arrangements. Are these constitutional arrangements and institutions working all right today? I don't know. We have to think about these things. Friends, the basic question to my mind and I'm really happy and slightly surprised that in a conference where hard issues of economy and policy are being discussed, something as abstract and as almost exotic like being Indian is being discussed. I'm very happy about it and slightly excited also. Because if this idea of India, if this idea of liberal democratic India has not evolved out of our own cultural traditions, then certainly there are going to be the problems. We are facing a lot of these problems because we have consistently and systematically refused to have a dialogue with our tradition and a dialogue with those who live out their tradition in their everyday life even today. I have been reflecting and thinking about these questions for quite some time. Three years ago I published a book about the great poet Kabir, but it is not just about Kabir, it is also about India of his time and India of my time. The argument which I have tried to make in that book is very simple. The genius of India, the genius of Indian people, the accumulated cultural experience of Indian people it speaks in Sanskrit, it speaks in Persian, but more importantly, it speaks in the so-called vernaculars, which we consistently refuse to listen. We consistently refuse to interact with respectfully. I have mentioned this in my book, and I would like to mention this to you also, friends. I am sure all of you have seen this great or famous Devanand film, Gai. In this film, there is a particular scene, this poor chap, Raju Gai, having been out of jail recently, has come to a village. Village people take him for some kind of sadhu, sant or fakir and they start giving him some food regularly. He is allowed to sleep in the temple. So he is having some kind of settled life after all this upheaval of last so many years. The village priests feel threatened and they want to undermine Raju's moral or spiritual authority. So they come to him one day and they start asking him questions in Sanskrit poor Raju cannot answer because he cannot understand, he does not know any Sanskrit. So the priests are very happy and they tell triumphantly, Bolenge kya? Sanskrit aati ho tab na? Now this becomes a question of existence for Raju Gai. Like a good post-independence Indian, he starts forth in English. He starts speaking whatever comes to his mind in English. Now the poor priests are at a loss they cannot speak anything. And Raju Gai says, Bolenge kya? Angreji aati ho tab na? My dear friends, the point is in this country, there are many people, and there have been many people for last 1000 years at least, who did not speak either Sanskrit or Persian, or who do not speak English today, but they speak a lot of sense. And we must listen to them very carefully if we want to make a democratic idea of India, a felt reality, not just a declared goal. We have to listen to those people. Kabir was one such man. Vidyapati was one such man. Akha Sunar from Gujarat was such man. Meera Bhai from Rajasthan was such woman who spoke in the language of people and who spoke a lot of sense. And they did not speak sense as peculiar individuals. They did not speak sense as out of their time people. They spoke with their time and their time had a dialogue with them. Pre-British India was not an intellectually stagnant society. We con constructed an idea of pre-British India as a stagnant society and therefore we tried to borrow all of our models, not only of development, but also of intellectual reconstructions and reformulations from the best. 
even the great admirers and followers of Gandhi ji felt uncomfortable with Gandhi ji about his idea of going back to Indian people in order to construct a rejuvenated India. And that is why a situation has come today, personally I feel, that we do not really have a dialogue with the indigenous discourse of democratic values, of individual dignity, of individual strength. We do not even bother to think in terms of public sphere, outside the public sphere of English-speaking persons, English-speaking people like us. There is a public sphere out there. It has its own distortions, it has its own problems, but still it is there and it is more effective. How do we interact with that? That I think is the most important question because these questions are important for policy planners and industrialists and captains of industry for the simple reason that if you really want to become a vibrant economy, if you really want to become a strong nation state, then you have to have a sense of self-worth you have to have a civilizational core, otherwise you can only become a large-scale Dubai. In spite of all your great natural resources and in, in spite of all your great number of people. Friends, the point is, just one another, two things I would like to mention and I think they speak for themselves. We were, in the last session we were talking about devolution from center to local and all that. In the so-called medieval India, which I prefer to call early modern India, I see people like Kabir and Tulsidas as part of India's own modernity, not as part of a stagnant medievalism. In this so-called medieval India, in this so-called early modern India, there was a sense of whole India, there was a notion of whole India, and there was a great respect for the local tradition and local culture. The much maligned Brahminical tradition used to adjust and accommodate the local traditions and local cultures. That is why I, being a Baniya from Western India, have been brought up in a totally vegetarian milieu, and my wife, being from the same community, Baniya, but from Eastern India, has no problem with non vegetarian food. The adjustment with the local. In fact, in 19th and 18th century, the British administrators and Indologists tried to, you know, kind of document the so-called Hindu law or Hindu scriptures. They realized that the same scripture is read differently in Bengal and differently in Maharashtra and Gujarat. We have not learned from this. We have adopted the culture of minuscule islandish country where one size fits all. Therefore, our all, all our universities will function the same way, all our institutions will function the same way. And that is why, in spite of all our progress, in spite of all our great achievements, there is a sense, at least amongst the young people, there is a sense of not belonging to any particular idea. Not belonging to a sense of sense of a, a, a nation with a certain destiny. And that, for someone 50 plus, is a very sad kind of feeling for me, personally. And yet, the hope also comes from the young people. Currently, I happen to be a member of UPSC, and one of the jobs of a member of UPSC to interview the future administrators of this country. Two years ago, I was interviewing these future administrators and I had a girl in my boat who preferred to be interviewed in Hindi because she could not speak English at all. And even in Hindi, she was not very comfortable or proficient. She used to slip into her Haryanvi off and on. And her father was a casual laborer in one of the Delhi hospitals. And she was from Haryana. I tried to provoke her on this question of khak panchayats and I tried to play the devil's advocate, saying that, look, after all, it's a matter of family honor, it's a matter of custom, it's a matter of tradition, so what this love marriage business, prem viva, prem viva, 
why can't these young men and women listen to the sane voice of elders and accept whatever the panchayat say? Why should they create a situation of confrontation? The girl tried to argue with me, considering the fact that I was going to award her marks, which could make or break her future. She tried to be as polite as possible with me, but finally she lost her cool and patience and told me in no uncertain terms, no uncertain terms, Sir, aap kuch bhi keh lo, ek desh mein do kanun na chal. I wish some of our policy planners, makers of law, and implementers of law also have the same courage of conviction to tell the powers that be that sir aap kuch bhi keh lo ek desh mein do kanun na chal thank you very much